Hello there, and welcome to the closest I can get to some sort of cool holographic time capsule. If you are listening to this within the next 346 days, happy 2020. 346 days as of the time I'm recording this. If it's past 2020, I hope you're having a good 2020s decade. And if it's past that, the reason you're listening to this is probably because the world's ended and this is one of the last pieces of entertainment left, and if that's the case, I hope that's going okay for you. Uh, something will rise from the rubble eventually, I hope. Anyways, uh, if you're watching this, you probably already know, but my name is Miles. This is a, I guess now, yearly tradition of my favorite things of the year. I record a video about it. Uh, favorite entertainment. This year, I've drawn a little sketch for all of the main list things, Uh, and I'm also going to talk, I guess, about some advice going forwards, mostly for myself, so I don't forget my own good advice, because I do that way too often. Anyways, the categories will be video games, my... uh, I guess, area of expertise, music, films, uh, books, and a bit of TV. I don't watch that much TV, but I watch some. And then after that, I'll talk about my uh, most anticipated for next year, so I can keep log of my changing tastes over years. I think one day this recording these will become something fruitful, plus they're nice to listen to. Uh, I wrote something that I should read. Uh, as for everything this year, I didn't first experience all this stuff this year, and it didn't even all come out this year. Some lists hold very rigidly to stuff that was released this year, and if you want to get that list out of this, just extract things that were released this year. Actually, huh, I don't think any of this was released this year. Films, a couple of them. Hmm. Anyways, uh, sorry, I-, I didn't experience this stuff first, uh, for the first time this year. Sorry, I'm going to read that again, that was bad reading. I didn't first experience all this stuff this year, though, if it's on this list, I've been at least thinking about it this year. Sometimes items become more potent in your memory than they were ever were in their real sort of physical state. Sometimes that potency travels over into the item retroactively. It's sort of difficult for me to separate my memory of a thing and the actual thing as it exists sometimes. So apologies if my memories or thoughts about a thing are just wrong. They're right to me in the version of it that exists in my mind. I... I guess you could call that nostalgia, but it's not always nostalgia, because it doesn't even have to be something I like, per se. It happens to everything. A topic, maybe for another time. I'll probably end up talking about it. Uh, Regardless, most, if not all, of what I'm talking about on this list comes down to matters of taste, so objectivity was never really an issue anyway. It's... Put simply, if it's on here, I've been thinking about it this year, and that makes it worth talking about. I say, merry decade end, but because of the fact I'm very late to recording this, it's more, uh, merry new decade. Or past it, or, or before it? I mean, if time travel comes into the picture, who knows? Um, yeah, so I guess I'll get right into video games. And the first one I've got listed here is Deity Driving which is a game I played, I think, maybe around June? Uh, my memory for dates isn't great. Though, I downloaded it on itch, and I think just a whim, and I loved it. It, It's a game that's art is very much collage-styled, though a specific kind of collage that It's almost, hmm, it's sort of a digital collage, and I know that's something you will have seen on the internet before, but aesthetically, it most, 
manages to be cohesive in how bizarre it is, but not like the co- the bizarreness is necessarily the same kind. It's the consistency of how bizarre it is becomes its consistency. It's a game where you drive a little car around and you chase after a raspberry, but that's a very vague kind of description because the game's more about the things that happen along the way. And I don't know, it's so many little bits of it stick in my head. It's not a long game, but it's a game which has such a interesting and varied presentation and it just it keeps moving along to new things and showing new new stuff and it seems hmm there's some really interesting sort of parallax scrolling effects in it it brings to mind something weird you'd find on a cd rom at a garage sale or in an op shop just a bizarre thing it's the collage approach of it is really interesting i don't i know one or two of the assets like the main car you control was actually photographed though mostly they just seem to be sourced from random locations and lots of photos are of physical toys Uh, how do i put it it's a game i really can't pitch to you easily Uh, and my job is here isn't to pitch it Though it's free on Itch, it's free on uh, Steam as of, I think, today, actually, or maybe yesterday. Um, And if it's me listening to this in the future, we have it on our hard drive. If you're still using the black hard drive we've been using for the last two years. Uh, If not, you should have it saved somewhere. We don't like throwing stuff away very much, or maybe we've changed. Who knows? Anyway, Deity Driving is super inter- interesting in its style. Uh, it's it's sort of... It's funny. It's a funny game, too. It's funny in its silliness and ridiculousness. But mostly I was interested to see in what it was going to do next, because it keeps doing new things at such a consistent rate. Uh, the game's <laughs> main objective... One of the main objectives is to lower your IQ stat, which I find funny. I don't know, just putting stats on, or just giving you numbers attached to ridiculous things is really funny to me. Uh, Oh, I have to go. There is some pasta ready. I'll be back in a second. Hello, I left to eat some pasta. I'm back. You just heard. The pause is very small for you. It's actually very small for me too. I ate that pasta frighteningly quickly. It's maybe been three minutes. Anyways, uh, sorry if the audio quality is a little different. I'm sitting up now instead of lying on my stomach because I think I'll be able to sit, think better if I'm sitting up, right? Uh, in terms of deity driving, I'm going to come back to it because even having three minutes to think about it is useful and because I don't think I was speaking my whole mind about it. Deity Driving reminds me of my memories of a game called Fairy Tale Activity Center, which is a CD-ROM that I still own, and I don't want to play, because my how I remember the game is almost definitely more interesting than how it actually is. Fairy Tale Activity Center, as I remember it, obviously it's Activity Center, so it has other things in it other than the bit that I remember. And it's promoting a movie called Fairy Tale. As I remember it, it was a game where you looked at a garden, or almost like a mural image of a garden. You scrolled back and forth across it. You took photos of fairies. You developed them in a red room uh, where old photos used to be developed. The thing about it is, I don't remember anything else about it. I don't remember much of the gameplay, but I do remember it presentationally. And there's something very vivid to the dreamlike images in my head. The reds in the red room are redder than any red a human being has made could be. This seems like a tangent, but I'm going to try and do tangents this time, because I think tangents can lead to some interesting stuff. And that game, in my memory, is something I'm trying to make stuff like constantly. Or at least recently, maybe not 
constantly recently, I'm trying to take the most potent stuff from my memory and actually make it exist. Because right now it only exists in my head, but I would like it to actually exist, and then maybe that can go into someone else's memory, and it can become more potent, and we can keep making weird... We can keep distilling the same ideas down to the parts that matter to us, and then recreating that and birthing new things. And I can't say exactly why deity driving reminds me of that. It's something... It's to do with the presentation, it's to do with the photographic images of things just being in the game world, and kind of the feeling of the environments in an offbeat way. Uh, deity driving is immediately interesting to me, at least, because it's not clearly built in any engine. And once, because I've worked in engines, or game engines, when I see something's built in an engine, I start kind of looking for faults, almost. Not consciously, but I acknowledge it's part of a game, and I do with all games. But Deity Driving immediately has a slight more, a slightly larger sense of mystique to it, because it is its own thing. It's on its own executable that boots up in its own style of window. It just exists as itself. It doesn't exist by proxy of something else. Deity driving just exists fully as its own thing, its own mixture of parts, its own singular strangeness. And that's fantastic. I'm looking to make and find singular strangenesses all the time. That's what I want to do. And I found one this year. A really interesting one. And I don't know. I think anything that can be singularly strange is almost a work of minor genius. But that's my own thoughts about game design, and that's almost certainly going to change over time. In future years, maybe midway through this year. I don't know. It it doesn't change entirely. The foundations are sort of the same, though the sort of upper-level reasoning might change a bit. I think I need to stop talking about deity driving now, because I have ground to cover. Uh, next game. The next game is Dusk. Wow, Dusk. Uh, I've played, I first played Dusk, start of last year, uh, 2019. Uh, Dusk is what made me make Kissy Fight. Dusk is the, I think the best first person shooter I've ever played. I know game feel, despite being upset, accepted, is sort of a nonsense word, which is really hard to define. I guess there's some stuff like screen shake and character movement, but Dusk has got a lot of game feel. Uh, specifically in character movement, the way your head tilts slightly to the side, and just the way the guns reload properly, or not all the guns reload, but, well, they have sort of reload times. Never mind. Dusk, I think the place that Dusk really shines though, especially over my attempt to, of a first person shooter being Kissy Fight, is its level design. Dusk's levels are great in that they manage to feel both quintessentially video gamey in their layout, but also like real places. Like, you've hit this really lovely balance between this is a house that people live in. Sometimes it's a house. And sometimes this structure exists so I can shoot guys in it. And there's something there. It feels like maybe it's just adding little corridors and superfluous rooms that don't really have anything in them. Uh, maybe it's all the branching paths or the sort of ways that the roofs fit together. I don't know. This probably sounds like nonsense to anyone else, but it will also sound like nonsense to me very soon, I'm sure. Uh, anyway. Let's slow down a bit. Dusk has some really good bits. I like how, as the game gets more sinister, it also gets more claustrophobic. You, some, you transition levels by going, especially within the sort of two, last two-thirds of the game, 
by going down. And as you go down, the game gets more and more surreal. It has this great curve where it starts off interesting and obviously like dark magic y stuff and it's spooky, but it gets more and more strange and twisted. And so the um, thing that it does real really well is something I've noticed. You start out above ground, then you go underground, and then stuff gets weird underground where you're like, you're not sure if you're underground or above ground, and sometimes you you get deeper and deeper, and then eventually you get into areas where the open sky is showing, and it throws off your sense of positioning in this world, which is what Dusk is going for. Because it's a game about horrible creatures and their distortions of reality at a point. Um, and it nails it by throwing off any idea of how space works by just almost using skyboxes and caves. That's the thing I also really like about Dusk is how much time you spend crawling. There's a lot of... you Sometimes you have to get between rooms, or quite often by getting down with the crawl button and moving through incredibly tight gaps. And there's something interestingly claustrophobic about that. It's not... claustrophobic isn't quite the right term. It's a sense that you can't move back. Like, in Dusk, you'll crawl through a tight gap and then drop suddenly down a hole. And the knowledge that you can't go back makes the fact that you don't know where you're going spookier. Uh, the game... I don't need to describe gameplay to you. If you're interested in it, it's a first-person shooter. It's a brilliant... It's sort of retro-styled, uh, which... God, everything's retro-styled in some way. You've got bits of... You've got retro, in air quotes, elements in everything. So... I guess... Throwbacking to sort of Quake-style shooters. Though, it's throwback... Never mind. Anyways, Dusk is... Great. It's fun, it's got great atmosphere, uh, the music is very good, though it starts to wear on me a little after I've played a level a couple of times. Uh, Dusk is great to just play, feels good to play, I gotta play, I'm gonna play the endless modes for so long, I finally beat the campaign this year, it was brilliant. Dusk is a lovely, chunky thing, it's a... Uh, it's a... it's good. <laughs> I, I was trying to think of a food to relate it to, because games fit a lot with food, and all I was getting was a chunky, like, Heinz soup, but I don't think I've ever had that. I think I'm just thinking about a line from a podcast called Till Death Do Us Blot, where they described Paul Blot as a uh, chunky soup. So that one doesn't work. That one's not okay for me to use, because I've never had it. Anyways, Dusk is very, very good. Uh, atmospherically, gameplay-wise, just across the board, it basically nails everything. Uh, I don't know. I guess I could have complaints about it, though I'm not really here to complain. I'm here to talk about the things that I loved from these projects. Maybe I'll become more critical as I'm older, though. I find it difficult to really... I find it almost impossible to really hate something. Though I can criticize most things. I just prefer to like stuff than not. Anyway, that's Dusk. Uh, next is Electroplankton, which is a game I haven't put enough time into. I've put it on an R4 chip. Shh. That's a crime card. I'm not meant to have one of those. Uh, and I played it on a uh, pink DS Lite I bought from Savers Superstore. I think it classifies itself as a Superstore. If you're not from Australia, Savers is a company that... Or it's like what you would call a thrift store, though we call them op shops. It's a warehouse full of stuff people have donated. Sometimes they have old technology there. They have weird toys and, like, a bunch of PC point-and-click mystery detective murder games, which was a weirdly big niche in the, like, around 2004 and to, I think, 2010. I've never played any. I'm gonna probably buy eight of them and play all of them at some point, because I'm genuinely curious to why they're such a long... Uh, 
Long standing. I know the people who made that recent Cthulhu game. Uh, what was it called? The Sinking City, I think? The si- people who made The Sinking City used to make Sherlock Holmes games. I think those Sherlock Holmes games were like the cream of the crop of the weird detective games that you can find at Savers. Um, they, they look released around the same time as PopCap games, but not as cool as PopCap games. I'm... Hmm. I really want to play those now. Uh, anyways. I, uh, put Electroplankton on my DS, and immediately after starting, started playing it, I realized this is how I want every VST plugin ever to work. It's music by play. It's just... I'm sorry, I'm swallowing a lot because I ate some pasta and my mouth is still salivating. It's going to be, if you can hear it, a terrible audio experience, but I'm not dredging back across all this recording to remove all the sounds. I'm sorry, I don't have the... uh, I do have the time. I don't have the uh, energy. I I have the energy, even. I don't want to. (laughs) I want to make this thing quickly. I want to leave it as pure as possible. I want to be able to listen back to exactly how I slipped up later. I don't want to abridge myself. I don't want to cut myself out. I want to exist as I do now in this recording. I've wasted a lot of time not talking about electroplankton. Electroplankton is a beautiful thing. The deaf word video game is stupid, but I don't think I'd call Electroplankton a video game per se, or trying to define a video game is stupid. Anyways, Electroplankton has been aptly described as a series of musical toys, though I think defining them as musical toys is a little weird, because I think all musical instruments are pretty much a toy. I mean, they're, re- they're toys with a lot of depth, and they're toys that people get really into, though, at least in how I interact with them, I play a, like, I play piano and I can make music on my computer a little bit, but making music is part of play, it's a process of playing, it's a process of moving sounds around, uh, repeating things and making them fit together, it's, uh, it's very much like play, at least for me, and electroplankton just works like that, the, uh, The workflow for creating little sounds is very quick. You can get in within less than a minute. You can be making stuff. It's not complicated, but it gives you specific limits. And you work inside those confines or outside of them if you can find exploits. And you try and make the most interesting things you can. Something I really like about electroplankton is how imprecise it is. And I know that's going to annoy some people, because some people want only precision from musical instruments. They want it to do exactly what they want it to do. But the problem is, or at least for me, as somebody who isn't as musically skilled, I can have very distinct visions of what I want, and no way to express that. So that never works. I've had to throw out the process of thinking of something I like, and then trying to make it. That doesn't work for me. What I have to do is... Start fresh. No ideas. Go in as blank as possible and just go. Just go until I've got something I like. And that's exactly what Electroplankton wants you to do. Make It's not a game about making songs. It's a game about making sounds. Sounds for yourself to enjoy. You can... It's very tactile. It's on DS. So obviously it's got touchscreen mechanics. But it uses them in a way that feels meaningful. You're positioning things and sending things flying towards them as they ping and make different noises and they'll repeat the noise that you've created ad nauseum until you change it and so sometimes I'll just make a noise and I'll sit there listening to it for a while I'll just sort of let the noise wash over me until I'm done with that noise and I'll make a new noise it feels like music creation pared down to its essential core. Uh, And obviously, I'm sort of waxing poetic instead of describing what the game is like. 
but electroplankton's... Actually, it is kind of hard to track down, though. If you've got a will, there's a way. And I think if you enjoy making sounds, just in general, not even necessarily with musical instruments, if you're interested in the sounds that things make, electroplankton's a good thing to seek out and play with. It's just a beautiful, elegant thing to have. It's a video game as a thing. It's not... It's not a game that you buy to finish. It's a game you buy to use. It's, uh... You just use it. You pull it out occasionally. You record some audio. You have it play it back to you. Or you spin some things around until they make ambient drone sounds. And then once you're done doing that, you put it away and you pull it out again sometime. You don't have to pull it out any time. It'll continue to exist as a thing that you own, that you can use. And uh, that's beautiful. It's a just a beautiful, it's an elegantly packaged thing. It's just a nice, it's a game is a nice object, and I really like nice objects. I own, I b blow too much money on weird little things to put on my shelf. Anyway, that's electroplankton. Uh, what's next? Next is <laughs> my game, Hissy Fight. Uh, I don't know what else to say about Hissy Fight. I don't. I like Hissy Fight, obviously. It came from me, and it's a lovely thing in some ways. Uh, it's, well, it's lovely that it came from me for me, though I don't think it's a perfect game. I don't think it's necessarily a shooter that's incredibly fun to play. I think I made it too hard, though I'm stubborn about how hard it is, and I probably won't change it now. I, uh, the reason it's that hard is that throughout development, Whenever I got bored with it, like it felt too easy, I tuned the difficulty until it was no longer boring for me. And then I kept going until the point I reached the point where it was never boring for me. And that's the point I left it, because it's a shooter that I was making. I didn't want it to be boring for anybody. And I don't know, maybe it's not mechanically fun enough that people want to get good at it. But if they do get good at it, I think it's at a point where it's not boring. It's not boring, or it won't be boring. Uh, it reminds me of, there's a game I've been playing on my DS called uh, Bungayo Spirits. And that feels like a game that'll never be boring, even if I got really good at it. Which is very unlikely, because Bungayo Spirits is very hard and strange, and <laughs> it's complicated complicated in it only has a few mechanics but those mechanics can do a lot of stuff so it's an action game I, I don't I'm not talking about Bungaro Spirits I'm talking about Hissy Fight and there are often things I like about Hissy Fight I like how from far how the gun works from very far away and I like how you shoot only one bullet the enemies have a very specific amount of health and you've only got one gun so if you're good enough you can measure out the exact amount of bullets that'll kill them it's very satisfying to hit the mouse button twice and watch a thing die, as opposed to mashing on its dead body when you start. I like the fact that there's actual verticality to the world. That's not something that had been shown in previous releases. There's a weird... It goes up and down, and it goes... Uh, it goes flat down, flat for a little bit down, up and over, down, through, down... Up, 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 across, up, up, up. You shoot out a window, you could jump a long way down, you fight some guys, then you fall a long way down, then you move vertically, then up again, then down again. There's a lot of upping and downing, though, with a general downwards direction, because you know, it's easier to fall in a first-person shooter than it is to jump. I made Hissy Fight specifically because I didn't want to... Well, part of the process was I was playing Dusk a lot, and I wanted to make a game... And I didn't want to agonize over it. I didn't want to spend a long time thinking about every detail and how it would all fit together like I did with my past project, Void, which had failed. What I wanted to do was just... I just wanted to make a game, <laughs> basically. And Hizzy Fight is just wanting to make a game, so here's the game that I made. I... I don't know. My 
thoughts on it will definitely change over time. I'm not totally 100% happy with it, but I would be lying if I said I didn't like it. And maybe I just like it because I'm the creator. Though, I think there's some interesting stuff there, and I think if I ever go back to making first-person shooters, I'll be able to take stuff from it. If I make a Hissy Fight 2, which I have ideas for, but I couldn't make because it's stupid and ambitious, and I think that's a good thing for a sequel, because if I make my sequel idea so ambitious that I can't do it, I won't spend my time making sequels, which is a good thing, because I don't really want to make sequels, unless they're very big and ambitious. So, Hissy Fight will continue existing. I've made it, it's done. It's, it's there. <laughs> uh, I earned money from it, which is something. I don't know if it's okay to say this, though I earned $140 from it, and I'm incredibly thankful for that. I expected to earn between $15 and $25 on it total. I really didn't think I'd earn anything, but I did, and that feels remarkable to me. I'm technically, at least, a professional game designer, which is all I've wanted to be, really. Well, I mean, a good person, first and foremost, though a professional video game designer is somewhere close. That's what I've wanted to be for the past three years or so. And, I mean, technically I'm that now. And that's thanks to people wanting to play my games. And that's fantastic. And I'm I'm thankful. For, I, I'm just thankful. Thank you. Thank you for playing my game. It, uh... I'm talking fast at the moment. Because I'm excited to talk about this sort of thing. But thanks. Uh, if you can hear guitar from the other room, I haven't added it in to make this more emotional or anything. My little brother is just practicing guitar, and the walls in this house aren't particularly thin. Thanks. <laughs> uh, next game Hylex If you haven't noticed All the games are in alphabetical order this year Because I didn't just want it to be the games I thought of first And had the most to say about up the top And All the games that I kind of put on Because I found thought were interesting and worth talking about But didn't have as much Uh I didn't have as much to say about them, I didn't want them to be last, because then I would burn myself out at the start and I wouldn't talk about the rest. So they're alphabetical this time. Anyways, I think I have a bit to say about Hylex, but to be honest, I'm not sure if my previous thoughts about the game hold any water. Hylex is an RPG, or it's a recreational program with light JRPG elements, which is legitimately one of the best video game descriptions I've ever heard, and I wish people would give such beautifully accurate descriptions of their video games more often. Uh, Hylix is a recreational program with light JRPG elements by Mason Lindroth. You play as some clay, or a digital representation of some clay that exists in a clay world, and you do an RPG in the loosest sense of the word. Hylix is a game that likes to play with and joke about structure. All of the dialogue, or almost all of the dialogue in the game, is complete nonsense generated from random strings of words. And the game still works. You still know how everything works because you know it's an RPG and you know how RPGs work. And the game relies on that. Its plot is complete nothingness to you if you've not experienced other plots before. It has a literal three-act structure. You play as a narrator at some parts who says a bunch of nonsense and then pulls some levers and then the words Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 show up. It's sort of teasing or poking fun at the way stories exist and how they're predictable but that can be used to our advantage by making something that is simultaneously so bizarre that no one can really understand it while still understanding it well enough to go along with what it's putting out. Hylix is a game that thrives on the fact that it doesn't have 
a lot of substance. I think you could draw a lot of meanings from Hylix. I was at one point thinking about writing an essay about how Hylix is a meditation, or not a meditation, God, that I use that word too much. Hylix is a game about, uh, Hylix thematically is a game about how we play, how we assign value to meaningless objects. And in a way, you could say the game is about that because it's built out of clay and it's built out of plastic sometimes. You can see a lot of the enemies are plastic toys with clays clumped on top. It's, uh, you can say that that exists, the pared down story exists to mimic the way we play, or children play at least. These are items that should, if we were being purely logical, mean nothing to us. We don't know anything about them beyond maybe their names and like a couple of lines of dialogue that tell us nothing. But we're able to imprint onto those because we know the way worlds exist in fiction and we know how that works. And I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that's totally true anymore. Hylix exists as, at least visually, a singular strangeness in a similar way to deity driving. And with the sequel, it seems like it's continuing what it's doing, but spreading it across more genres. So I'll see. And having two entries in this franchise might actually mean I can figure out some sort of through line or what I hope for is that I won't and it will continue existing as something that completely escapes me because I think that's what it's made to do. I think in a way Hylix is a game that pokes fun at meaning. Uh, if the audio quality just changed again, I'm lying down on my stomach again because my back hurt because my posture's not great. I'm trying to work on it. Anyway, Hylix is a very nice thing. The music... I guess some people could call it annoying, but I think I think it's nice. I think Hylix is a nice game to spend time in. I like experiencing it again every year or so just to look around it, just to see what it's like again, because I can't quite hold the fullness of it in my memory. I can remember imprints of it. I have ideas of what happened in it, but what happened is not what Hylix is interested in. What Hylix is interested in is, well, <laughs> the art, in a way. It's what where most of the care went. I guess the RPG combat, too. It's got shockingly solid combat. It's uh, really well-balanced, uh, for the most part. It's, uh, it's an interesting-looking game. The Aesthetically, the clay and the way it's scanned in gives the game an enormous texture that other releases fail to find, even if they're beautifully normal mapped 3D where everything has, well, actual texture. There's a te you can Im there's an imagined texture to the clay that's just lovely. Hmm. But, I don't know, me talking about the visuals isn't going to do much for you because I can describe how something looks to you for a long time, but it's not going to give you as good an idea as if you actually just looked at how it looked. So, yeah, play Hylix. Play Hylix if you can. It's very cheap. It's on itch or Steam, but buy it on itch, because God, if you can, just buy everything on itch. It's a great website, and the creators probably get more of the money. And Valve, by God, Valve doesn't need any more money. <laughs> uh, next game. Boy, howdy. There are a lot of video games, aren't there? People just keep making them. Uh, next is Metal Gear Solid Five. And, as a disclaimer, I think Metal Gear Solid V is very stupid somewhere, and I won't try and defend shit like Quiet, because it's, uh, it's not okay. It's just sort of bad. <laughs> it's gratuitous, and it doesn't exist for any good reason. The writing excuse, I don't know, that has no place in the story. It, it's very clear why it's there. But, Metal Gear Solid V is a game is interesting, at least, in that I'm extraordinarily bad at it, and I'm very happy to be bad at a game again, because, or at least, no, I'm bad at a lot of games, but I'm happy to have a game that 
regularly kills me and tells me, no, you messed up. And not in a sort of Dark Soulsian, it's hard for the... It's not Dark Souls isn't hard for the sake of it. Never mind, I've never even played a Dark Souls. I'll get around to it at some point. But and what I like about Metal Gear, or Solid 5 at least, I haven't played the others, I know a fair bit about them, is that Metal Gear Solid 5 is built on the bed of sim uh, systems. Having so many systems that individually I can handle like i understand how all the mechanics individually work though when you're out in the field everything mushes together and all the systems start interacting with each other and suddenly i'm completely lost again like you give it gives you a general sort of objective and then you got to figure out how to do it and okay i understand technically what i have to do but there are now a hundred hurdles in the way, and all those hurdles are making new decisions because they're talking to the other hurdles. And it's really hard, and I mess up all the time, and I just have to try and ride with those failures. And I don't know. I think all the systems on their own are very enjoyable, and they become more enjoyable in their unpredictability. The game keeps doing new things, or at least I keep having to try new things to keep up with what the game's doing. And... I just like it. <laughs> it's not a game I have incredibly deep and meaningful thoughts about. It's just a game that I like. Uh, obviously, yeah, it has problems, and I'm not super willing to excuse all of them. That's not what I'm trying to do. But Middle Gear Solid Five is pretty cool in some ways. Uh, what else? One other thing I wanted to say about it is I think the game design a bit with Mother Base and the field or the actual place where the I guess the quote unquote gameplay takes place is a dynamic that I've thought about a lot that is pulled off really well. It's the safe zone where you can hang out between the missions. It's just pretty much it's just yours. It's totally safe. You don't have to do anything. You don't have any threats against you. It's quiet. It's nice. You can get your stuff together. You can literally in Metal Gear Solid, take a shower, which is great. It's your home. That's home. And then the gameplay area is the field. And it's, I guess I can call it home and field game design because it's funny to stick stupid names to different things, especially where in games where nothing has a clear definition and it's all stupid anyways. So home and field game design is where you have half or at least a portion of the game be safe and quiet and the other portion be dangerous and at least cons consistently threatening at least most of the time so you have this great dynamic where you're out in the field and you're doing stuff and it's all kind of a rush and you got to have all your wits about you and then you get in in this case the helicopter to go back home and you're just like oh, I can relax I can de-stress I can take a shower, I can get all my stuff in order, and I can just chill out here on this cool oil platform for a while. And that's nice. It's a nice thing. It's reflective of going out all day and coming home. It's gamifying relatable human stuff, or just things that people know, and then putting that on a larger scale, which, I don't know, I think games could be really good at if we're willing to let them do that more. Maybe they do that all the time, and I just don't have the capacity to relate to everything. Though, taking more simple things and turning them into game mechanics, or at least simple feelings and trying to gamify that, is nice, and certainly something that people think about all the time, especially game designery sorts. But, I don't know, I thought that was a really good execution on one of those, and I just wanted to pinpoint it. So that was uh, Metal Gear Solid Five. Next is Muscle World, which is another itch game that I played this year and I loved. Muscle World is very slow and it's very atmospheric. And I don't know, it's also free. You play as a muscle guy and you sort of slowly swing yourself across the top of this huge 
bottomless pit, or maybe it has a bottom, it's unclear. Eventually, you start seeing geometry in the distance, and you land on it, and it's a parking garage, but it's upside down. And what on earth happened to this place? Why is it like this? Why is it so dark? What am I doing here? And you spend so long moving from place to place because your guy is slow that eventually you start having to engage with weird questions and you're just swinging. There's very little to it, but it's got a great atmosphere along with it obviously having a sort of silly sense of humor. It felt like it started as a silly joke and then got serious in how it was made, and it's lovely. I've played a few of the other... The person who made it's called Photocotria, and I've played a few others of their games, and I really like them. They can, They have a consistent atmosphere, and... Describing atmosphere is hard, especially considering I haven't played the game for about half a year, but it's also free, and it's on my hard drive, me. So, give it a shot. Uh, it's good. It's really good. I mean, you got to have sort of a taste for slower things, but if you're listening to me ramble about games for, like, 40 minutes, you've got some sort of weird tastes, or you like me, which, in which case, either way, uh, thanks if you like me. If you've got weird tastes, good on you. Keep owning weird tastes. More people need them. Uh, anyways, the last game is Quadrilateral Cowboy, which still remains, I think, my favorite game ever. At least... I, I think I like labeling it as my favorite game ever, but it's a game that has a lot of stuff that I think is fantastic. Uh in that it does so many things well. And I think the thing that it does most well is environments. They are gorgeous. They are put together with the know-how of somebody who spent hours staring at the way walls fit together and door frames connect and how everything works. There's a real functional... It's re All the architecture feels both surreal and functional at the same time. It feels like, well, this exists weirdly, but this could exist. Uh, no matter how strange the game gets, it always keeps its grounding in reality just because of how practical everything feels. The There's so many little things in the game that consistently wow me, like how the gadgets that you control with your computer are completely separate. You can place them wherever. And just the way the computer works is so elegant. Like, the screens you watch other devices on are placed separately from the computer. So when you plonk everything down the pile, you have to be accurate about where you position stuff. You give yourself sight lines to objects, or if you're using the camera, you have to put it at specific angles. So you get to the system of methodically putting things down and picking things up which is almost becomes a little ritual over the course of the game where you lay down this work site with all your stuff next to you, all your gadgets spread out, and then you sit down at your computer and you get to work. And that's the sort of stuff I love doing because it's making games and it's making music and it's making anything, I think. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't made everything yet. Or I haven't at least tried to make one of everything, so. Who knows, but... The more I think about it, I find something new to think about every time I think about it. And I think that's gorgeous. And I could honestly do that with any game, but I find my mind coming back to Quadrilateral Cowboy often. I've beaten it maybe eight times, and I always enjoy it every time I do. It's no filler. It's just back-to-back -back quality. Everything is good, everything is in its place for a reason. It's just a lovely game. Uh, <laughs> it exists fully and sort of perfectly. I uh, I don't really have any problems with it. I, I wish there was more of it, but if there was more of it, 
maybe that more would have gotten worse over time. So in a way, I'm also glad there isn't more of it. I'm glad it exists as it does now because it's beautiful. And I, I'm just happy it exists. So thank you, Quadrilateral Cowboy. If you're listening to this, I'm not great at convincing people on a gameplay basis, but it's a, it's a fantastic game. Uh, everything on this list is worth playing if you, if you like games, I think. Anyway, that concludes games and moves us on to music. And we're already an hour in. This is going to be a long one, huh? Anyway. Music is, first is The How, How, Much, Much, and I by Cosmo Sheldrake. I'm considering pausing this and then playing you a little bit of the music because I'm not worried about being demonetized, but they could make it be taken down. I don't think any of these artists are big enough. Two of, all of these albums are on YouTube anyway. Um, anyways, never mind. The How, How, Much, Much, and I is... S- sort of sort of a folk album kind of a little bit I don't know how quite to define it it's probably an album that's much more easily defined but I think genre in music is kind of wacky anyways and doesn't always work there's so many genres and subgenres that just at a point it's almost and I mean as long as music becomes more and more interesting, more and more genres are in it. And at a point, it's just worth saying, this is what it is, and trying to describe it instead of putting it into a category. So the How, How Much, Much, and I, like almost all of the music I really love, beautifully mixes organic and produced sounds. Produced meaning... I'm not quite synthesized, but I think you sort of know what I mean. Uh... It's an elegant collaboration between actual instruments and the ways they can only really be connected with the use of a computer. And the How How Much Much an Eye is so rich, it's just filled with love, beautiful lyrics and fantastic... The music builds fantastically and the amount of instruments and sounds, it's just a deep, rich thing. It's... I'm talking about how things exist too much. I'm going to try and stop. I don't like being in patterns. The How, How Much, Much and I is... Hmm. I guess I'll play you a little. Again, it's kind of useless, I feel, to describe how it sounds because you can just listen to it. It's better to listen to something than have someone tell you how to hear it in your mind. It's good. How much, how much, much an eye is really lovely. I, uh... All the music... I'm going to talk about four pieces, or four albums plus musicians uh, in the music section. All of these are albums that at some point have made me just go, Wow and just kind of be taken aback by them. The How How Much Much an Eye is in the beauty the and the simplicity. And not that it's simple, though it uses a lot of simple things incredibly well. It's just elegantly composed. It's full and... I'm saying full and rich. I've described it, but that's what it is. I... My host of adjectives is sort of failing me. I'm not great at describing music. It's lovely. The How How Much Much and I is very good. It brings to mind old stories I heard growing up and communes I've been to and just nature. It feels like nature in a lot of ways. Uh, It's... I grew up around a lot of uh, hippies and artists and sort of new agey folks in my early childhood. So I have a connection to kind of earth imagery and nature imagery. And a lot of that is evoked by this album. 
and I think that's probably one of the reasons I connect so strongly to it. But even if I didn't have those, well, would I connect as strongly to it? I think so. I think I'd still be able to appreciate the raw compositional power in it. There's a lot of emotion both in the lyricism and in how the music's put together and the way they intertwine just power makes both of them more powerful. It's great. It's a great album. Uh, the next the next one is Igloo Ghost. I've been listening to since early last year, actually late 2018, but I've been listening to consistently throughout this entire year. I don't think a week's gone by where I haven't listened to at least one of his songs. Igloo Ghost is fantastic. It's, uh, again, music that I think combines naturalistic and produced sounds brilliantly, though maybe more erring to the side of produced. It's some of the most ingenious electronic music I've ever heard. It moves incredibly fast, it changes often, drums fly everywhere, melodies just get swept out from under your feet, and yet it feels consistent. Each song knows what it's doing, and it does it in a thousand different ways in a very short span of time, and that's fantastic. The amount of work that goes into an Igluyo song is, I mean, I imagine, mammoth. And all this stuff has been said before about it. I've read interviews, I all this stuff said before, but what I think doesn't get focused on enough is quite how atmospheric the work is, because in between pummeling drums and just constant noise, there's a there are some really lovely, almost breathy vocal moments thrown in to tracks and just drawn out just a lovely sort of atmosphere behind everything. And if you choose to hunt for it, you can find it in there, as you can find... I imagine almost anything in these tracks, considering how much there is there, they're great. I think Igloo Ghost's accompanying storyline is really fun and gets you to listen to the music in a different way, where you're searching to try and associate all the meaning or all the sounds with different events. And I think while that story is fun, it's also important to sometimes drop it and just listen to it as music and try and dissect it in as many ways as possible. The I'm I'm just excited to see what comes next. Uh, Igloo Ghost is an, uh, an incredible project. It's not... I guess it's a project. I don't know. Musician. I, I love their work deeply. If you want to get into a specific album, I think... Moving chronologically is a great way to enter into it. While Clear Tame is my favorite EP that they've or piece of set of music they've rele- uh, that uh, he Seamus Malaya has released, I he gets he starts more melodic and becomes less and less melodic as he moves along. Though melodies still remain, they just become more obscured. So if you're coming from a background of listening to a lot more melodic music, like I did. It's worth moving moving into it a little more slowly. I don't know. If you're listening to this, you'll probably be able to drop in just fine. Do whatever suits you. Uh, next, ne- next album is uh, Paradise View, which is a 1985 film score by Japanese composer Harumi Hosono, who I understand is actually quite famous. So, I didn't know about him till this year. <laughs> Uh, Paradise View is, I think, my favorite of his albums. It's all on YouTube, so it's very easy to listen to. Uh, I feel like I've given you, if you're listening to this, a lot of homework, a lot of things to do. But if you're anything like me, you actually kind of like homework. So, well, it shouldn't be that mu- that bad for you. Paradise View is long. It's not ambient, but it's very... A friend described it as soundscapey. It's... Each song has a specific idea, and it does that idea 
until it could feasibly, for as long as it feasibly could do that idea, and then it stops. And it moves on to the next one. But there's an overall, a real sort of earthiness to it. A, I hazard to describe it as spiritual, but sort of. It's an album with a very interesting and unique uh, atmosphere. And it sort of informed what I'm, I want to do with my music, at least a little bit. Again, a great intersection between natural and synthesized sounds. As I think synthesized works just one in this one, but I don't know. The fact that I can hear all the sounds that are probably made with a computer and then imagine sort of the instrument that they'd be composed with is fantastic. It's... I don't know. Again, it's, a, it's another singular thing. I've never really heard anything specifically like it. Stuff in the same vein as it, obviously, though nothing that's kind of gone in its direction as much it, it, as it has. It's not drony. It's not, it's not too sort of ambient and drony. It's not too traditionally musical, I guess. It's just, well, everything's just themselves, or just itself. But Paradise View is just itself, which I'm saying way too much, but I think I have a consistent thing where I there's one thing every year, which I repeat too much, and then I come back to it the next year and I kind of find it funny. So... Hopefully you find it funny the way I'm talking about stuff in a specific way, and maybe that mean, will mean something to me later. Anyway, next is Doopy Time, which is another Japanese album, though from 1995, by Yan Tomoda, who's a, uh, a steel drum player, and two vocalists who... I... Names aren't coming to mind right now, but they, uh, they play characters over the course of the album called Susie and Carolyn, or Caroline, and the album is experimental, but it's very playful in how it, it experiments. It's, it's very earnest, both in the fact that it is not afraid to do something super weird, but also gives you a grounding point in having two characters almost chime in little bits of narration throughout to remind you that there's still a human touch there, and you you feel like you can hear the way it was made, almost. Or not quite. It's, it's playful, and it acknowledges the fact that it's strange, but it doesn't shy away from the fact that it's strange. And it wants to welcome you into it. It's got themes of uh, coming of age and growing up and sort of the ch uh, friendships and emotions. And it's got a really dreamy atmosphere to it in that it feels kind of ethereal is a, almost an overused word when referring to atmosphere, though it feels like it fell out of another version of Earth that's just much more floaty and dreamlike. It feels dreamlike in a misty sort of a way. Uh, it's very much reliant on samples, and it pulls samples from a lot of places and ends, has ended up being sampled in other places. And it's a thing that both celebrates music and celebrates people and it's a happy a gentle just album it it is what it is <laughs> to have said again after paradise view i'm gonna stop holding myself up on it because it must be even more boring to hear my me talking about it than it is to listen to me saying it doopy time's great uh has a ridiculous name but I don't know. If you can't, uh, if ridiculous names keep you from enjoying things, you got to get your priorities more straight. Next is films. Uh, 
almost not even halfway there, though I generally have less to say about films than I do about games. I talk about games in a lot more depth. First is Alita Battle Angel, which is just super fun. Uh, the Robert Rodriguez, yes, that's his name, directed the Spy Kids and then directed this with James Cameron, who made Avatar, or I guess is still making Avatar, if you consider Avatar 2 a movie, and not, as I usually do, some form of bizarre tax fraud, because I guarantee you that's why that movie's still being made. Anyways, Alita Battle Angel is a movie in which some cool robots fight some other cool robots. There's some story to it, though it's got a really cool kind of roller derby-esque sport, and I don't know. Robert Rodriguez's movies are campy in the best ways, campy in the ways that make them the most fun watching experience possible. At least that's my experience with the Spy Kids films, which are where I know him his work best from, but A Little Battle Angel carries that on. Uh, I think, actually, with the films, I was going to read my reviews for all of them as I do them. So let me just pause the recording quickly, and I'll be back once I've got all the reviews open. Hey, I'm back. Okay, here's my review of A Little Battle Angel that I wrote on Letterboxd, which was... It is the best film adaptation of a 2010's New York Times best-selling young adult uh, novel that never existed. It is the greatest sequel to Spy Kids 3D I could have possibly asked for. It was a cyborg riot. I loved it. It's just... Robert Rodriguez makes films that are for watching. They're not necessarily for thinking about an enormous amount afterwards, but they are just the most fun watching experience possible, and they're often very weird, and that's great, because watching weird things happen is fun, and it's fun to do with friends, and then those weird things start to fight, and the fighting's great. Uh, the plot exists in a way that's schlocky, but again, schlockiness can be fun to watch. If you've got good friends to watch it with, who are on a similar page towards stuff, or even a completely opposite page, you can still have fun with it. I don't think it's... I think it's almost impossible not to have fun watching a Rod Rodriguez movie, at least from some angle, and that's why I love Alita Battle Angel. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> uh, that's not... I can't do a deep analysis for you. It's just great. And an speaking of just great, next is Being John Malkovich, which again... I. I'm sure I could have come up with something insightful to say about this movie, or uh, some interesting thematic reading, though I haven't thought about it that much. I just remember getting to the end of it and going, wow, I really like that. It's a uh, magical realist film about people who can go inside John Malkovich's head for a while. Uh, one of them's a puppeteer, Things happen. Uh, it's just a strange movie, and I'm just a, glad it was made. Uh, it's a movie that is unapologetically odd in its story, in its locations, in its characters, and is really unlike anything else. It's just not tropey at all. There are no tropes in it, almost. It feels like it was defining a bunch of its own. I guess there's probably micro-tropes in it, like small things, but there's no major plot tropes, nothing I felt I could see coming. It's a strange movie, but it executes on its strangeness incredibly well and makes it an interesting drama. And, I mean, also kind of funny. <laughs> it's just a great movie. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure I've said I don't know that much. And I actually do know, I just said what I think about it. Being John Malkovich is a great movie. The next movie is G-Force 2009, which I feel obligated to put on here, because it's not a good movie, but it is a movie I watched twice this year, and I continue, I plan on watching again probably tonight. G-Force is a movie made in 2009 by Disney about some talking guinea pigs who solve spy crimes. Or, not spy crimes. They are spies. One of them's named... 
Hurley and he's comic relief. And one of them only says one-liners. And one of the one of the uh one of the guinea pigs is Spanish and also treated as attractive to the other two guinea pigs. It's weird. There's a mole, there's Transformers style robots, except they're fridges. Uh I've heard the video game adaptation is really good. Which is weird, because I definitely have memories of playing it, but I never owned it. Maybe I played it on the Wii at a friend's house. Everyone owned a Wii. I never owned a Wii. G-Force is a movie which I can quote multiple lines from. It's not a good movie, but it's a movie I love watching. <laughs> so it's on here. Uh, it's... I don't know. It's... Oh, God, I said I don't know again. I do know. It's a kid's film that is, like, not good. It's not good children's entertainment. It doesn't have anything to teach them. But in the same way as Spy Kids, it's a movie that's fun to watch. Although, not schlocky in all the right way. In fact, there's a lot of tropes in it that are complete garbage. But it feels like the origins of those tropes to the point where they were a little more earnest than they're done now. Like, a big celebrity, or not a celebrity, but... A big song that is recent being in it. Like, uh, Gotta Get That, Boom Boom Boom, that song, which the Black Eyed Peas made, is played, I think, three or four times in the movie, and every time it's funny to me. At some point, I'm going to curse myself and do a the worst idea of all time thing where I watch this movie every week for a year, and I'm going to grow to hate it, and I'm going to hate my inclusion of it on this list. Because it's a bad movie, and it's not a movie you should watch. But it's also a movie you should maybe watch if you like shit sometimes. And not even shit... It not even is if you like shit like you like to laugh at shit. G-Force just feels like a satisfying movie to watch for me, in a way. Uh, I'm gonna go through my DVD of it, because I do own it on DVD, and I'm gonna watch it in every different language, and I'm gonna try and experience G-Force in as many ways as possible. Because I'm, for some reason, uh, a fan of G-Force, 2009's extended Black Eyes P music video. Uh, G-Force Forever. <laughs> Next is Napoleon Dynamite, which is a great film. <laughs> I really liked it. It's sort of an awkward comedy, but I think the thing I most appreciate about it is it's a film about strange characters, but it's not a film about laughing at those characters. It's a film about accepting those characters and just treating them like any other character would be treated. They're weird people, but they're also just people with highs and lows, and they're doing their own thing. Obviously, it's a funny movie, and it's a funny movie because it's about strange people, but it's never at any point a mean-spirited film. It's actually a film very much in celebration of weird people. Uh, I don't really want to talk about anything specific that happens in these movies because, I mean, a lot of the fun of watching movies is going in completely unspoiled. So if you like funny movies with sort of a little more uh, to the awkward side of things, so not totally awkward... And you like strange movies, oh, not strange movies, it's not a particularly strange movie sans the characters, but if you like strange characters, you'll like Napoleon Dynamite. You've probably heard of it or seen it before, but if you haven't, don't Google it. If somebody says something, if somebody whose opinion you usually respect, and I don't know if you respect my opinion, but if somebody whose opinion you usually respect tells you that something is good and you know nothing about it, that is the holy grail of recommendations, and you must experience it without knowing anything about it. Trust me, it's the best way. Next is Parasite, which is another movie like Being John Malkovich that just hit me with a wow at the end. Though not because it executed on strangeness as well as Being John Malkovich, but just that it, I, it's an incredibly well... It's like a very tight movie. It's very tightly written, very tightly directed. It changes genre about three times. And again, it's kind of hard for me to say anything without spoiling these movies, except for G-Force, which obviously I don't care about spoiling because it's bad. Uh, but <laughs> I don't even want to say thematically what the film's about. 
If you're on the internet at all, you've heard of Parasite, and you've heard of it for a reason, because it's a very good film, and it really is a film you ought to watch. It's good. It's got great twists and turns. Uh, that's a dumb way to put that, but whatever, I'll own it. It's got great twists and turns. The rev uh, reveals throughout it, which is exactly the same thing I'm saying as twists and turns, just in a new way, are great. Uh, it's... It's a movie that moves in directions that I didn't expect it to. And God, I just like it when things break my expectations a little bit because I feel like I know every trope and I know everything Hollywood's going to do. And I hate being able to tell the plot of a film before I've watched it. Except, ugh, fuck, I guess G-Force is the exception. Next is Spirited Away, which... Christ, if you haven't watched it, what are you doing? Spirited Away is... Just a gorgeously atmospheric movie. Artistically, it's beautiful. Like, I think the story in Spirited Away is obviously good, though I fixate more on the backgrounds. Because, in a similar way to Quadrilateral Cowboy, no matter how surreal and bizarre it gets, the backgrounds or the locations remain... <coughs> well, I've been talking too long, sorry. Um, the backgrounds remain grounded. Grounded in a practical reality, the back rooms of locations are functional, while the fronts have a glossy veneer, and it's surreal and otherworldly, but still pinned in the reality of that other world, and I'm just so happy when fiction does that, because, I mean, it's more fun when you're creating fiction to go just be like, I don't know, it just works because it does. And there's a real legitimacy to that, and I don't ever want to try and police how people write or make things, but I really like it when things have a consistency to them. Or a, I guess, a consistent legitimacy of feeling, if that means anything. That's something I like about Spirited Away. I could talk about it forever, but obviously I'm also trying not to be spoilery. Actually, I can talk plenty about Spirited Away without being spoilery. It's beautiful. It, so many moments of it are evocative of feelings that of everyday feelings, though, in the context of the movie, almost in the same way as what did I call it before? Uh, home and field level. Uh, home and field game design. It's doing the same thing for a film. It's home and field directing now, though. I mean, sort of adjacent to home and field. Like the exper like the taking of simple human things, sim experiences that everyone knows, and then turning those into core parts of the game, the film, and just I don't know. <laughs> God, I gotta stop saying that shit. Turning the core, turning these basic experiences into I sort of distorted or amplified versions of themselves that we're still able to attach ourselves to because we know the core of the experience. And that's something I think Spirited Away does very well. I could fill an entire hour talking about it, which I won't, because I'm running at an hour and 20 minutes already. Shit, we've reached feature length. Oh, God. And there's still <laughs> a lot to go. Um, next next film is Spy Kids 3D, Game Over, which I love almost for the same reasons as Alita Battle Angel, but maybe a little more, because a lot of the film is like, video games, huh? How fucking cool are they? And I love that. I love media that kind of misrepresents video games, but has such a, a seeming excitement towards the idea of them and the internet that it's really endearing. It's like, ah, you have such high hopes for these things. Uh... Spy Kids 3D Game Over obviously just uses video games as a front, but again, I have a soft spot for we've gone inside the video game and if we die, we die in real life. Especially if the CG is super schlocky, which it is in Spy Kids 3D. Again, Robert Rodriguez movies are so schlocky in all the best ways and just fun. It's just a fun movie to watch, always. If the audio just seemed to jump there, I got interrupted and I took a short break and now I'm back. Though by short break, I mean 
five minutes, roughly. So, really short. We were last talking about Spy Kids 3D Game Over, which is the only, I feel, good, or a proven good style of video game movie, which is the sort of movie that uses the tropes of video games as a dropping-off point to create a new story. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World does this very well as well. Though Scott Pilgrim vs. The World does it with more tact and taste, but it's still just about as fun as Spy Kids 3D because Spy Kids 3D does it with so much less tact and taste. Thank you, Spy Kids 3D. You would have been probably not that good a video game. I don't know if there's a tie-in game, but you're a great video game movie. Next is Under the Silver Lake, which is a movie I really liked. I saw it in cinemas with my friends in the Nova Independent Theatre in Melbourne, which has great chalk top ice creams. And it's a movie about conspiracy and paranoia and kind of how the upper class are doing whatever they like, and also the fact that LA kind of sucks shit. <laughs> Uh, the film's garnered some negative critical or negative reception because of people saying it sexualizes women or it over-sexualizes them, and the argument can certainly be made for that, yeah. And I understand where people are coming from, and if that turns them away from the film, sure, more power to them. Though I think that serves the film's message about how the society we live in sort of eats up and churns out these actors, or at least the culture within LA and most of the world, sadly, chews up and spits out people and takes advantage of them and sends them... Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's I haven't watched the film recently enough to really go in-depth on the themes, though as a fun viewing experience, I really enjoyed it. It's... I get got some tropiness that I could predict, but the directions, those, the actual results of those tropes, the tropes never kind of, the tropes never impede on the plot. You can see a trope coming, but you can't see where that trope will lead, and that I'm fine with. I don't mind that the tropes are there if they're not directly dictating the direction the plot is moving. And they never do, as far as I can remember. There's a lot of great shots and a lot of great ideas for things in this movie. I'm a sucker for kind of supernatural stuff happening in suburbs or conspiracies, so it got me on that itch. But in general, I think it's a very well-made movie about those things, and I feel like it's also a movie that's made with things to say, though I need to watch it more times to dig into it. I'll be looking for it next time I go to JB Hi-Fi, basically. It's a good movie. It was my favorite movie, I think, that was made this year. And I appreciate that it's a movie that leaves things not wrapped up. Like, it introduces a world, it throws a character through it, and then they come kicking and screaming out the other side, and they barely understand half of the shit they saw. And that's great. I love that. I love that it's something... You're just passing through something bizarre. You're not meant to become the Lord High Ruler of the bizarre stuff. You're just meant to see it, go, whoa, weird, and then move on your way. Uh, and you don't, you don't get to know how this all works. That wouldn't be in service to the film. Good movie. I liked it. Next up uh, in the list, we have books. I actually read books this year. I mean, I usually read books every year, but I've actually started enjoying reading again properly this year, though I've enjoyed reading in the past. I fell out of it for a course of about uh, four years. And what got me back into reading will be the, I guess, actually a combination of all of these three. The first book is a novel by Haruki Murakami called Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World, which is a half detective novel, half fantasy sort of novel. Uh, it alternates between stories each chapter. And this is the, I guess, the piece that really put... I'm sitting up again because I'm tired of lying in my stomach. 
this is the book that really put pushed the hammer down the nail that I like reading again. I read it voraciously over the... Well, not voraciously. Uh, in a sort of a faster pace than I usually do over the course of the end of 2019. Specifically when I was on a trip through Central America. Which I didn't talk about that much on my social media. Mainly because I don't really like talking about everything I'm doing on social media. I don't know. I like having things to myself. Anyway, it's a trip I went on with a group of people. We fundraised for it all year. And it was half a traveling trip and half volunteering in a group. Uh, in a... Not in a group. In a village in Central America. Building houses and rendering the outsides of them. And I got into a really nice habit over there of reading maybe two chapters of the book a night. And it brought a really lovely consistency to an otherwise... Uh, like a brilliant trip, one that I loved and I could talk about forever, though I won't, because, again, I like having some things to myself, but it gave a consistency to a kind of time where everything was changing constantly, and there was just something lovely about that, something solid uh, as a book. Solid as a rock is a song lyric from somewhere that's coming to my mind. Solid as a rock. Oh, I don't know what song that is. I'm sure I would if it was played to me. Anyways, uh, the book, it alternates between stories every chapter. Uh, or not, sort of alternates between stories. But there's an interesting thing it does where slowly the stories start to reference each other in a back and forth of kind of deja vu. And you'll go, wait. That means these are connected somehow and not just sort of thematically bouncing off each other? Wait, how are they connected? And you start playing detective as both of the main characters are also doing at least similar things, getting you into a pretty, like an approximation of their headspace, which obviously all good works try and get you in the character's headspace at least a little bit, though this does it in a really interesting way. And you're trying to piece together not only each of the individual mysteries, but how both of them sort of connect to each other. And I don't want to spoil anything about the book, because it's nice, again, going into something without knowing what it ha what happens in it. And obviously, I read the book like that, and I loved it like that. So read it like that. If you want a book that is both a page-turner and also nicely written, like written quietly in a way even when exciting stuff is happening it has a sort of introspective tone to it which i really appreciate um uh, i just like stuff written in that way or at least i think i do i haven't read enough to say i have specific tastes yet and that's why i'm excited to read more coming into the next year so hopefully this book section will be much longer next year and i can judge myself if it's not anyways uh hard-boiled wonderland and the end of the world is a great book two great stories also yeah uh, I'm not gonna say what I was about to say it would have been a spoiler in a very roundabout way I'm not gonna spoil anything as much as possible though I probably accidentally have previously anyways good book real a real page turner five out of five on goodreads I don't know if goodreads.com uses fives or tens I don't one thing I don't like, I don't like when 10s, t uh, 1 to 10 ratings have decimals. I think that leaves too much space for indecision. I just came up with that opinion. I will I might hate it later. Who knows? Next book. What's the next book? Next book is In Watermelon Sugar, which is the book that got me back into reading. Uh, in Watermelon Sugar is short, it's breezy, it's practically the green tea of books. It's a beautiful palate cleanser. It's a book about some people who live in a town, some things happen, and then it ends. Uh, the things aren't of universal importance, they're just sort of the livings in that town. And it's a book that throws you into a world that is simultaneously knowable and yet alien to us. And... It doesn't have any interest in revealing its secrets in a way that we would understand. Characters often refer to things 
in with words that we know, though those words to them mean something completely different. And they just don't let us privy into what they're actually talking about. We can guess, but we don't get direct explanation. This isn't a book written for you. It's a book written for the people there. And that's so interesting. It's written in extremely short chapters. Uh, like sometimes less than a page. It's still... It's just... It adds to the feeling of being alien. But at the same time, it's a very relaxing book to read. It's written with sort of a detached, factual air about it. And even when, like, kind of horrific stuff is happening, it the way it's written makes it all feel like it's going to be all alright. And obviously you can read it in a lot of ways, but it's sort of the book, it's a sort of thing that is just nice to let wash over you. I think people forget that one of the ways of appreciating any work is not, you can analyze something, sure, and that gives you a deep understanding of it. But sometimes a understanding just as deep can be gained from just feeling a thing, just experiencing it. And sometimes I feel like people forget that. You can just have a thing happen around you and be a part of it for a little while and then send it on its way. In Watermelon Sugar is lovely. I would... I don't know how you read, but I'd recommend it to you if you're interested in reading a good book that's not a great time investment. It, uh... It made me remember why I like books, because it was easy to get through, and it was lovely. It was enjoyable, consistently interesting and enjoyable. And the last in the book section, which is more sort of cross-media writing in this case, is Tim Rogers, video game critic, video game designer, amongst many other things. He has a long history in writing and making stuff both in personal writings and in his current job working for kotaku.com but i uh i just think he's somebody who's worth reading <laughs> i really i'm been following tim's work i think since midway through last year but i seriously got into reading some stuff or some of his older writing or things that weren't directly on his work for kotaku and I don't know. I just, I love the guy's writing style. He writes about video games in a way that is pretty unique for the form or how people typically write about video games. He writes about his experiences surrounding video games and he's lived an interesting life. I like reading and listening up to his experiences and I guess that's kind of, I don't know if voyeuristic's the right term, though it feels like it sort of is. And I don't want to say I'm interested in him only for his life, because I guess that feels creepy. Though, he has lived an interesting life, and I appreciate his work. Uh, I find some of it heart-wrenching, I find some of it funny and just enjoyable, but it's consistently Tim Rogers' writing. And I look forward to reading more of it in future and just working through it and finding new pieces by him that I really like. Not much more to that. I just think he writes about video games and his life and everything in between very nicely. I hope one day he releases some of the seven unpublished novels about tennis that he's written. I really want to read them. Next up, our last category... That's right, only five more things to go, but actually a bit more than that, is uh, TV. And so, next up is Adventure Time, or not next up, first up is Adventure Time, which is, I actually watched some Adventure Time tonight, just a regularly beautiful show. It mixes, it mixes funniness with, genuinely lovely moments and I think it really hits its own in season three before that it finds it hard to balance its jokes with a slightly darker tone but I think it really it figures out what it's figures out what it's doing at that point at season three and then beyond that it just hits the mark constantly right up to the end and has interesting themes of time and the sort of cyclical nature of time and consistency, uh, family growing up, uh, a lot of stuff, but 
I think where it shines is in both its incredible originality in just its setting, loca- its locations, characters, and situations, but also in... Uh, it's quieter moments. I think my favorite... Some of my favorite episodes are just the ones that are, I guess, almost could be described as filler episodes, but they're just filler episodes with good concepts. Uh, I really like the episode King Worm, because it's incredibly dreamlike and kind of spooky. What other episodes do I like? Uh, I like the episode Little Folks or Little People, or Here Come the Little People. I watched that one tonight. That's a really good one. Uh, Adventure Time's great. It's background designs, and it's backgrounds, and uh, of, especially background character designs are lovely. Uh, I guess you, some people might have written it off because it's got the kind of dot eyes thing, which, honestly, I'm not the hugest fan of, but Adventure Time actually pulls it off by the dot eyes don't seem like they're doing a cute thing. They seem like a stylistic choice, and they're changed often. Uh, I don't know. I Adventure Time's good. It's a really nice show. It's introspective and interesting sometimes, and also generally just fun other times. It alternates between the two very well. I like its sort of conversational dialogue. I like how it's not... It doesn't feel ad-libby. It feels tightly written, but it also feels natural how people talk. Uh, I mean, as natural as it gets in a world as strange as Adventure Times, but just consistently great. <laughs> I haven't finished every episode yet, so I can't say that, though. Post-season 3 is just fantastic. Uh, the Season 1 and 2 have good points, but, I mean, yeah, you get my gist. Next is Arrested Development, which I... I haven't watched... I watched it last year, and I can't remember everything in it, but I... It's just one of the most well-put-together pieces of television. The way it calls back on itself, the way its jokes are structured, it's just consistently funny. I've only watched up to season three. I have no interest in watching further than that. As far as I'm concerned, it's done. That was the ending that I... That was an ending, and it was so perfect up to that point, I have no interest in watching it further. But it was just perfectly put together, consistently funny, never felt like it was wasting any time, and always felt like it was building to something, even the re- if the reveal was, like, sometimes pushed under the rug, it was always pushed under the ro- rug for the benefit of a really good joke. It's the best sitcom I've ever watched. It Other sitcoms are like comfort food to me. I watch them and I acknowledge the jokes, and I sometimes think they're funny and occasionally they make me laugh but they're more there to watch they're kind of easy to consume whereas arrested development feels like it's not something it's easy to consume obviously but it's not made to be easy to consume it's made to be i'm feeling i guess if we're working in food metaphors i don't know arrested development is incredibly well written well structured well put together sitcom uh it is almost has some of the best running jokes I've ever seen, or the running jokes that just constantly pay off over and over again. The running bits about the Blue Man Group are incredible. Uh, <laughs> the Blue Man Group are really funny. Anyways, um, that's all. That's I'm done talking about Arrested Development. Uh, you can watch these, hopefully. I gotta hate Netflix. Uh, I acknowledge the fact that good things come of Netflix sometimes, but also, I don't know, just the fact that it's all online, I feels like it has very little permanence to it now. I, I still like DVDs, but I just wish... I don't know. Maybe I'm being an old man about this. Whatever. Arrest, uh, Arrested Development's good. Uh, it's probably on Netflix. I hate how there's a price of entry. Ugh, God, I'm not going to ramble about it. If you can find a way to watch these, do. They'll be online somewhere. Uh, I'm not advocating piracy, wink, wink. But I mean... Yeah, I'm not. I'm not advocating piracy. Psst.
I'm... Ah, never mind, that joke wasn't going to go anywhere. Next is a series of unfortunate events, which, despite my previous ranting, I did watch on Netflix and is indebted to Netflix's existence, and I really liked it. I hadn't read the books, though I had watched the Nickelodeon movie, and I had a decently good images of it in my mind, because that Nickelodeon movie has incredible imagery. Like, the TV show, I think, is better, though the Nickelodeon movie is so striking in how it looks. Anyways, a, um, a series of unfortunate events is... I think... I don't want to just compare it to the movie, because it's obviously its own thing, but the show has a fantastic pace, and it always has time to breathe. Each scenario lasts for two episodes, or each location before they move on to new characters, new locations, with the consistency of the recurring cast. But those recurring cast undergo changes of uh, slower changes, while the environments around them change quickly. It's got the sort of thing I really liked about Tintin specials as a kid, where... Like, I guess kind of the sitcom thing, like the sit part of sitcom without the com. The fact that you've got the same characters in situations. Though, I like it when the situations aren't anything like each other. Like in Tintin, I mean, there's a lot of ones about smugglers actually, but there's ones where he goes to the moon, and one where he goes to the center of the jungle. And some that I've heard are belligerently racist, which, uh, huh. Anyway, I, everything aside, I watched a lot of Tintin as a kid. Uh, the Tintin animated specials are really good, if I remember. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, a series of unfortunate events. It's constantly moving to new things. It's constantly showing you new parts of the world and building and building and building. Sometimes, early on, I've heard people complain that it's repetitive, though I think the repetitive nature is in service to its themes. Because thematically, it's a show about going through hard times and feeling powerless and having... I mean, it's a show about dealing with a series of unfortunate events in your life and how you need to hold people close, uh, close and how you need to cherish relationships and... I don't know, it has... I didn't expect it to have a lot of depth going into it as a kid's show, but I genuinely enjoyed it. It's got a fun sense of style, and... I mean, it feels like a really good kid's series, which... Uh, a really good kid's book series, which obviously it was, and it was just nice to experience the feeling of that medium in this different medium of a series of a television series anyway due to the title of this series i've been saying series way too much a series of unfortunate events it's good if you have netflix and you like things that are slightly gothically styled and you're willing to put aside the fact that the imagery isn't as quite as good as the netflix uh, the nickelodeon movie or i assume the books then Give it a go. It's kind of low budget at times, but it works really well. And it works incredibly well with what it has. It's consistently entertaining. And it's it's, it's good. I liked it. Next is Mob Psycho 100, which is an anime I watched. And, oh dear God, an anime. Uh, watch out. Anyways, Mob Psycho 100 is fun. <laughs> it's got good character dynamics, especially between... Uh, the characters are Brygan and Mob, and the action is very well animated, <laughs> uh, which is I, something I say too much. Not within this, though. Anyways, Mob Psycho 100 is just... I mean, everything on this list is well done, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't put it here, but Mob just shines in the... I guess the just the originality of its characters and their dynamics with each other. It's got fun action, of course, but that action is held up on the fact that you genuinely like the characters. And you like them because they're funny and they're unique 
and <laughs> their chemistry is really good. Uh, I, d I don't want to spoil anything about it, because I'm trying not to spoil it as much as possible about these, but if I had to give even the lightest synopsis, Mob Psycho 100 is about... growing as a person outside of the things that you were born able to do or trying trying to improve yourself outside of your innate talents not i don't even know if i never mind mob it's an it's a very good natured show uh i mean it's got bad-natured characters, but they're there as a foil to the ideology of the mains, or the leads. And, not a foil, I don't know. I don't even know what that word means properly. As an antithesis to the uh, perspectives of the main characters, and to challenge those, and to prove the main characters' points, in a way. And they prove them with a lot of explosions, and ghosts, and fighting. It's a cool cool series about friendship sort of but not in a cheesy way like that sounds last is russian doll which i don't necessarily have any sweeping thoughts about but it is a really fun show it plays the groundhog day loop in a much less comedic and more dramatic way though it's comedic mainly in the fact that characters react to it very realistically it's about, well, I guess I already spoiled a part of it, though I don't, again, want to go that much into it. Somebody gets stuck in a time loop on their birthday, and the best part of it is, I think the part that sticks most in my memory is that every day when they wake up again, the same song is playing, the same few lines, the, uh, gotta get up, gotta get out. And it happens every time, and that just drilling sense of repetition just hits you every, every, every time. And I, watching it, get found myself thinking about how it would work video game-wise, which is a sign that I'm really engaging with what it's uh, putting out, because I'm thinking, how could I adapt this? I really like that. And there's something about the returning to one location and hearing the same thing over and over again but played realistically is very video gamey and sadly i feel like if it was done as a video game people would give in to their desires and make it all meta -y. like ooh, they know they're in a game but i the tv show thankfully doesn't go in that direction because i'm sort of tired of that stuff at this point uh and the it's just, it's a self-contained story. It lasts for one season. It doesn't, it does everything it needs, it feels like it needs to do, and then it stops. It's got no filler at any point. It's just, it's Russian doll. <laughs> it's got, it's funny. It's got a kind of sarcastic wit, which I know isn't for everyone, though I enjoyed it. Some people find it sort of cringy, but I don't know. At some point, I moved beyond thinking things are cringy and just started enjoying stuff more, and I'm happy that happened. Russian Doll's fun. Uh, it was a fun show. It had, I mean, pretty easily identifiable themes, I think. They don't take a too much digging, and that's kind of relaxing, honestly, just to have them there. You kind of know what the show's all about, and you can just appreciate the merits of how it was made. Anyways... And wow, that concludes the end of all of my list. Though, not the end of the recording. You're not free yet. Uh, the last section is my most anticipated stuff for next year. And there's no drawing for this one, so I'm going to have to find something to put on the screen. So you might be watching videos of me exploring an abandoned house uh, that I found. There was no one living there. That's why it's abandoned. Uh, so... You might be seeing that. Anyway, I've written a note. This last section's a little more loose. Some cool-off stretches after my genuine discussion, kind of. I'm going to talk a little bit about things I'm looking forward to next year. Seeing as they're not out, I don't have a huge amount to say about them, with maybe a few exceptions. First up is New Igloo Ghost. With Oh, sorry, this is in music. 
uh, there's a few little sections. Uh, first up in music is New Igloo Ghost. I'm moving my body again, so sorry about audio quality change. Igloo Ghost has been teasing a new album or EP or LP or something or other. Anyway, a new collection of music for next year. It's got a very kind of drum-heavy, almost tribal aesthetic foot to it. I'm feeling blessed because it feels almost like you know, pretty much exactly all my favorite parts about his music being emphasized on the intersection of natural and produced sounds and also letting a little more sparse to let the atmosphere kind of shine. And I'm just, I'm just happy. I'm just happy it's being made. One of my favorite artists is making something completely to my liking within their style and I just I just can't wait I moved again sorry uh, it's hard to get comfortable anyways new igloo ghost we got a track list we don't know what any of the tracks are though I with all the uh, spirit in my heart and in my blood want to hear that album next is an album by I think, oh, I can't say where I think they're from because I don't know. Uh, the rapper Mr. Yodi, who has a, cool, uh, a style which is very, it's like, their, rap, their rapping is often pitched down or pitched up. Well, not actually pitched up, pitched down. And it has uh, a really eccentric kind of wonky flow to it, but very atmospheric production sort of beats in the background. Obviously, I mean, it's still exciting stuff to listen to. I love Yodi's work. I think it's uh, his rapping is really out there and interesting, rapping through characters almost at points unintelligibly. I think I've been thinking a lot about vocals recently in terms of their, the way they inter interact with music. And vocals, I like them and I don't like them. Because they give an entrance way, a easy entrance into a song. It's easy to latch onto vocals. But also, vocals make songs much more recognizable and almost make them me get tired of them faster. So there's pros and cons. And I really like the sound and feeling of vocals, but I don't always necessarily like there being vocals in a song. And that's something I love about Yodi's work, because it feels like a real intersection of those two things. Because you get the sound and the tone and the texture of vocals, and you get little bits of words that which make it easy to latch onto, but it's also very hard to understand at points, which leads to a great effect where you can focus on other parts of the composition, but still get the feeling of the vocals. And, uh, I don't know. Yodi is great. Uh, all this stuff, it's spelled Mr. Yodi, uh, MR space Y-O-T-E. It's all on Bandcamp and some on SoundCloud. And he's uh, releasing something called Pelo Phantasmo, which he's been working on for ages. That's a character of his because his music has a running storyline, which I've able to piece together a little of. But I'm just, I'm excited to hear more. Yay. Movies. I've written here. I don't really know any movies coming out next year. Edgar Wright's apparently got a new movie called uh, Midnight in Soho, I think. I like Edgar Wright's work. Uh, stylistically very fun. I'm excited to see that. TV. Um, Russian Doll Season 2. I mean, Russian Doll was self-contained. I don't know how they'll do it, but it could be interesting. Really hoping they take the concept and execution of the original and move it original season and move it to new characters instead of trying to make new characters to use I think that would or instead of using the same characters and putting them back into the situation I think that would be incredibly boring <laughs> though I have faith in the staff the first season was really tight and I'm excited I think they could probably execute well on a season two if they put in the work We'll see. Hopefully it's not just riding on the success of the first season. Next thing. There's a few new Adventure Time specials coming to 
HBO something, maybe? Uh, which might be good. I think the show ended perfectly, though. Uh, and it ended with a real encapsulation of all its themes. I really don't think there needs to be any more Adventure Time. Like, I, I'd like there to be, but that's an indulgence. I don't think I need there to be. I think Adventure Time's kind of done. I mean, I'll watch them, and I'll... If they're really good, okay, I'll be happy, though... I don't know. I mean, do we need more Adventure Time specials? It ran for 10 seasons, and those seasons are fantastic, and it's done. It's done. Who knows? Next up is games. First is Burrito Galaxy 65, which my friends teased me about, told me it's probably a pyramid scheme. But I don't think it's a pyramid scheme. I think it's going to be released eventually. Hopefully. Burrito Galaxy 65 is a uh, a video game that seems to encapsulate all the best parts of all the best GameCube era games in terms of the fact that it's... I don't know how to put that. That sounds like a stupid way to describe it. And it sort of is. But it's taking the best parts of weird games from that era... Uh, and just sort of mixing it up in a blender. And I really hate the way I'm pitching it, but it's hard for me to describe. It looks like a game that's both very fun to play in terms of actual interaction with the game, in terms of how the game feels, but also very fun to experience in terms of its world and characters. Uh, the writing is really tight and funny from what we've seen. And what, what we have seen, what I've seen. I'm at least a little bit obsessed with Brutal Galaxy. I made the wiki for it late last year, and I add to it sometimes. But there's not regular news. So hopefully we start getting more news next year. Otherwise, I'll keep holding out. I'm I'm just waiting. Uh, next is Knuckle Sandwich, which is an RPG that looks pretty cool. I backed it on Kickstarter, and I talked about it last year. It still isn't out, but progress seems to be coming along well. Uh, some of the... Like, uh, some of the trailers has made it seem to be sort of a metagamey thing. And while I'm sort of sick of games being about, oh, we realize we're in a game, I don't know. That's, I mean, I don't mean to restrict anybody. And if you want to make your game like that, sure. Uh, if anything, the music is really good for Knuckle Sandwich, and the presentation's nice, and the combat seems fun. And the char- it seems to have good writing from the demo I've played, and unless it goes significantly downhill, which I don't expect, I'm excited to play it. I I like RPGs sometimes, so maybe it'll be one of the good ones. Next, and the final thing I'm talking about today in games is Static, which we really don't know anything about other than screenshots. It's made by a game developer I'm friends with called Eli Corley, and someone else, but I can't remember who. Let me check. Uh, you're going to hear clicking sounds because I'm on my computer. Uh, um, hmm. Uh, and by somebody called Sound Letters, whose name is, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, uh, Amit Rai Sharma. And it's a game that's a, a, walk, a surreal walking simulator with audio puzzles inspired by modular synthesizers and Haruki Murakami, who's a novelist who wrote that novel I really liked. It was meant to come out in September this year, though apparently it's been shelved for a little bit. And, uh, well, I'm just excited to play it whenever it does come out, because I like all of the things it's inspired by, and the artwork for it looks lovely. Lo-fi in a very detailed, sort of lush way. You can see the screenshots on Twitter or on Itch, so hopefully you like the look of it and you'll be excited for it too. I'm just, I'm interested. I'm interested to see what it looks like. I'm interested to see it in motion and how everything fits together when hopefully it eventually comes out. And, oh wait, hold on. Actually, I did have another segment. I had some advice to read. Uh, This one will be pretty quick. I mean to end it out on a nice note. 
thank you for sticking me with this long. If you're still just skipping through, thank you for not just clicking off. Uh, my tips going forwards for New Year's special. Try your best to avoid cults as much as possible. That's one. Uh, sometimes it can be really tough to be yourself around other people. You've got to try, though. Playing someone you aren't or a simplified persona of yourself, it hurts. Eventually, you just can't do it anymore. And if at some point you forget who you were before, um, I don't know. That's for you to work out, actually. I can't tell you that, but try to be yourself as much as possible. Like... I mean, don't. I, that doesn't mean don't try and improve yourself. Try and improve yourself while still being yourself. Try to be the best version of yourself that you've yet figured out or created. And you don't have to be like that all the time, but just sometimes. Just try. It'll be hard. It can be hard, and you won't succeed all the time, but give it a shot. Next is take time to appreciate things, things that you like. Wandering around is good. Just... Look at the world and appreciate the things that we've got, because some things are really shitty right now, but there's a lot of great stuff that exists, and somebody's got to notice it, I think. <laughs> um, next is, get good sleep, though don't sleep too much or you'll miss things. Well, I mean, try not to sleep too much. If you still sleep, that's fine. If that's something you do, cool. Uh, more power to you, though. Uh... Sleep helps. Getting good enough sleep, if you can, is really good. It it just makes everything nicer. Uh, if you can't, though, again, take care of yourself as much as you can. Uh, what's next? Hmm. Uh, take weird opportunities. If something strange, or you, not necessarily weird... Maybe that's a word that didn't need to be there, but if you're given an opportunity, obviously you can't take all opportunities or you stretch, overstretch yourself and you end up unhappy with all of them. But if something you're like interested in is something you might be able to do, try to go for it. Like Take some risks or take some opportunities because that's the way I think you end up leading an interesting life by just sort of taking what's being put down. <laughs> I guess. Uh, next one is conversations feed your brain. You gotta have them when you get musty in the skull. It's true. Uh, I find if I'm around the house or if I haven't talked to someone for too long, I just get mushy. Everything starts to slip. My memories don't hold as well. I can't focus. It's important to talk to people. Human beings need it. I don't. I think it's a scientifically proven fact, but just in general. Human beings need people. We're built to be around people. We've got a mouth to talk to people, eyes to see people, and nose to detect people from a distance. Ears for the same thing. Ears to hear people. Try to talk. Uh, it doesn't have to be all the time, but just if you're feeling bad or listless, try talking to someone. I, I think it helps. Next, and finally, is for creativity... Motivation is skittish and irritating. Sometimes you just have to push yourself through the work to find the motivation. Power on. If you're having a hard time starting something, just keep working on it. Or just get into it. Sometimes you just have to force yourself to do something, and the motivation will find, yourself, find you once you start. I, I, think, that's, I think that's truthful. Uh... If you're able to force yourself, obviously. Yeah, like, again, first and foremost, bigger things are try to improve yourself if you can and take care of yourself. It's a harsh world out there. Can't have you being harsh to you. Try your best. And that's it. That's everything. That's my 23rd of the first time capsule for 2020. Uh, that's 23rd of January 2020. Some people do the first and the, the months and the days in different configurations. Anyway, thank you for sticking with me. It's last year's been an amazing year. I started making music. I released my first commercial game. I've grown as a person. 
I've slept quite a bit. Sleeping's nice. Um, but mostly, it's had ups and downs, but it's been a good year. And I've got a lot coming up ahead of me. Uh, I'm in year 11 this year. Two years until I finish school, and then I'm sort of out into the great green yonder. I don't know if that's the term, but whatever. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to me ramble about things I like. And if you're me, that still stands. Thank you for listening to your past self talk about things they like that might seem dorky to you in the future. I'm sure you'll be dorky to future self. Whatever. Thanks. Happy New Year, Happy New Decade, Happy New Apocalypse, if that's what's going on. See you all later.